Welcome everyone. It looks like we got a few people here. Uh, so I am glad you all made it to hear our presentation today. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. So basically what we're going to do today is, hold on, I can't talk and share at the same time I have learned. All right. There we go. So we are gonna do an overview of Uplands Ecology. And what I've done is I've taken some of the slides out of the Florida Master Naturalist program. Hey, if you've taken a Florida Master Naturalist class, will you type that into the chat box? If you're new to Zoom and you don't know where the chat box is, if you just take your cursor over the bottom of your screen, a little bar will show up and Usually it's at the bottom, it might be at the top, but a little bar will show up and there'll be an option for chat and then you can you can type into that. So if you've taken a Florida Master Naturalist class, which I already know some of you on the line have, or I think we even have one of our instructors on the line with us too, um, just type that into the chat. Uh, but what I've done is I've taken some of the slides from the Uplands Florida Master Naturalist core module. I've combined them into an overview. I'm going to go through some of that in about half an hour and I've made it more Sarasota specific. The Florida Master Naturalist Program is a course that speaks to statewide ecology in Florida, but um, because we have a shortened amount of time and this is just a preview, I thought I would make our overview a little bit more uh, Sarasota specific. And then I'm also going to talk to you about land management challenges in uplands ecosystems. I'm going to talk to you about the Florida Master Naturalist Program in general and I'm going to also show you some pictures of some of the field trips that we have taken uh, with some of our courses here. So that's sort of an overview of what we're going to cover today. I'm hopefully going to talk for just a little over an hour, which should be more than enough. And then that'll leave us about 20 minutes or so for you guys to ask any questions that you have about what I presented or the program or really anything you want to ask me and we'll see if I can answer them. Uh, so, there we go. Here's a little bit about me. Uh, I am the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator for University of Florida IFAS Extension here in Sarasota County. Every county in Florida has an extension office. We are a great resource for the community. Our jobs are to share the research that's done in the community or done at University of Florida with our community. So, Sorry, I'm letting people in from the waiting room. Hold on. There we go. So um, as the ecology and natural resources educator, I am in charge of a lot of things having to do with our natural environment and wildlife here in Sarasota County. Uh, I am an educator position. I'm not like Florida Fish and Wildlife. I don't do regulation. I'm not the Sarasota Planning Department, so I don't regulate developments or anything like that. I simply educate about our environment, which I love to do. So some of my main focuses in my position are I am a lead instructor for the Florida Master Naturalist Program, hence why we're all here today. I teach, I believe, five of the classes, many of which I co-teach with my other colleagues. And then we have a Florida Sea Grant agent at our office, Armando Ubeda, and he teaches the coastal and the coastal restoration uh, classes. I, I leave the coastal stuff to him. Uh, I also teach some of the Project Wild classes. I do an award-winning environmental education program for our school system called the LIFE program, and that's in partnership with our Florida State Parks. So we see hundreds of third through fifth grade students every year, and I run this huge like outdoor environmental education um, science lab uh, based program in Oscarshire, Mayaca, and our county parks as well. Um, which right now I'm trying to transition that into a virtual program. And then I answer a lot of questions. Right now I'm answering a lot of questions about snake identification and cane toads and who dug this hole in my yard. Lots of people are at home and they're seeing lots of things that they didn't normally notice uh, in their own backyard and they're sending a lot of those questions to me. 
So that's a little bit of an overview of about what I do here. I have a bachelor's in environmental studies from Buffalo, where I'm from. Uh, so clearly a transplant to Florida. Uh, and then I spent about 15 or so years training to be a physician and practicing as a physician. About three and a half years ago, I decided I wanted to go back into environmental education and got this job here at our extension office. I actually have the honor of living in Oscar Shearer State Park. So even when I wasn't directly educating about the environment, I was living in one of our natural areas. I've been there for over 20 years, married to my husband, who's currently the park manager there. And we live there with our two kids. We're all crammed in there right now, working from home. We've got a whole ton of animals as well. So that's a little bit about me. Here's a little bit about our extension office. We have one of the largest extension offices in the state. Extension offices are a partnership between the county they're in, University of Florida, and the USDA. And here are some of the program areas that we have at our extension office. We just reopened to the public, uh, let's see, last week. I'm actually in the office today. We're rotating so that there's only a couple uh, staff here at a time, but we are open to the public, although we are trying to uh, help our community mostly virtually if possible. But if you have questions in any of these areas, you can send them to our office email or give our office a call. Here are some of the programs that we run and right there in the upper right corner is the Florida Master Naturalist Program logo. And then I've just been asked by the county to remind you, if you haven't done your census, please do it. It's really important. It helps provide funding to your local area. Okay, that's enough of those announcements. So let's get to what we are all here for. Here are the things that I mentioned we're going to cover today. So we'll just get right into it because I already know I have way more information than probably an hour is going to be available for. So I'm going to probably have to go through some of the things a little bit quicker. So let's talk about uplands for a minute in general. So uplands are pretty much what their name says. They're the land that is up above, up above sea level. So here in Florida, we don't have big mountains, obviously. So the uplands sometimes are just characterized by a change in sea level by inches or feet. Um, so here are some of our upland communities. Pinelands, uh, so there you can read down the list here, but this is a map that's color coded to show um, which type of these natural communities that are uplands are throughout our state. Here's Sarasota County right here. And Sarasota County, as you can see, is mostly characterized in terms of upland environments by pinelands. We do have some scrubby flatwoods, which I'm going to talk about. They are in Oscar Shearer and a few of our county parks. We also, of course, have a lot of mangrove um, forest along our coastal areas. And then we do have some hardwood um, type areas, hardwood hammocks, and then also some hardwood swamps. And we do have a little bit of dry prairie in Mayaka. So I will talk about some of those upland areas. Of course, I won't talk about so much the freshwater and the coastal areas today. So here's just a little drawing that shows you sort of a habitat profile and the different sort of layers that you would see within a natural community. And of course, our natural communities are providing habitat to our wildlife. And different types of wildlife are going to use not only different types of habitats, but also different layers within the habitat. So a raptor, for instance, is going to often, a raptor or bird of prey is going to be up higher in our canopy than perhaps a bird like a scrub jay who doesn't like to go over six feet in height in terms of flight or where its nests are. So just a thing to think about as we go through this, we're also going to talk about some plants and in the Master Naturalist program, they're organized in terms of where they tend to be in this vertical layering. So there's three upland communities that are more specific or uh, more specific to Sarasota County. So we're going to talk or focus more on those today. So the first one we're going to talk about is an upland pine community. 
And upland pine communities, just like it says on the slide, are characterized by the presence of pine. And that composition varies according to geography and hydrology. So hydrology has to do with where the water table is and how wet the soil is. And that is usually one of the main factors that determines what plants will live in an area. We have a lot of pine flatwoods. So when I think about Oscar Shearer, I think, um, I think mostly about pine flatwoods and scrubby flatwoods, which we'll talk about in a minute. When I think about some of our county parks, um, I think about a lot of pine flatwoods as well. So pine flatwoods are distributed throughout Florida, but quite a few of them here in Sarasota County. They tend to be very flat and North and South Florida differ in terms of a lot of these communities um, are, and I think of us, where some people consider us Central Florida, some people consider us South Florida. We're sort of in the middle um, or on the border, maybe more appropriate to say, but we're definitely different than North Florida. Uh, flatwoods also depend on fire. Most of our plant communities, other than some of our hammocks, are very dependent on fire. So definitely our upland communities are dependent on fire except for hammocks. And pine flatwoods historically would have burned every one to five years. That's called a fire interval. How often they would have normally burned before there were all us people here and we were doing fire suppression because we're worried about our buildings and structures burning down. We're gonna talk a little bit, I have like a little section on prescribed fire towards the end. So we'll talk a little bit more about prescribed fire. Uh, to me, that's a super interesting topic. Uh, we just burned at Oscar Shearer yesterday. Um, they burned about 20 feet away from my house two weeks ago. So uh, I, I live right there with prescribed fire and it's a fascinating topic. Um, also, pine flatwoods are affected by seasonal flooding and seasonal drought. So both sides of that spectrum. Here are some of the pines. When we talk about um, pines in Florida, there are seven different pines that are native to Florida. Uh, these are the ones that we will most likely find in the pine flatwoods, the longleaf pine and the slash pine. Here in Sarasota County, we're mostly going to find the southern slash pine like you see on the right hand side because, uh, because the longleaf was pretty much timbered or lumbered out of our county. There was a huge both lumber and turpentining history here in Sarasota County and the longleaf pine communities really suffered from that. There has been uh, attempts at replanting them. The longleaf pine is the, the pine that uh, was the main pine throughout all of the southeast floodplain, which goes all the way from like the lower Carolinas all the way Florida and a little bit east, sorry, west as well. Um, so longleaf pine is a very diverse type of plant community and it's really important for us to try to either bring, either, re, sorry, conserve what we have or try to bring back what we have lost. But here in Sarasota County, if you're out in a natural area, most likely the pine you're going to see is slash pine. We also have a little bit of sand pine, I believe, in Old Mayaka Preserve, I think. Here's some understory woody species that you would see in pine flatwoods. Um, gallberry, which is one of our Ilex species, Ilex glabra. That one is very common. We see we have a lot of that in our upland Sarasota County preserves. And we also have quite a bit of fetter bush, which is one of our Lyonia species. And you can see Lyonias are related to blueberries. So if you can see the little blooms here on the fetter bush, they look very much like blueberry flowers because they are related. Um, both the Lyonia and the gallberry are going to be generally like four to six feet in height, depending on when the last management was um, done on the area. So we have both of these pretty commonly in our Sarasota County natural areas.
And then we have tons of saw palmetto and cabbage palm pretty much anywhere we look. Uh, so these are very representative of pine flatwoods as well as the saw palmetto is very, um, very common in our scrubby flatwoods as well. The really cool thing, well, I, I don't know, I love saw palmetto. I think there's a lot of cool things about it. Um, but the really cool thing that I like to talk about with saw palmetto is that it grows through underground rhizomes. So rhizomes, they are not a root. They are actually a modified stem. Your grass plants that are probably growing in your yard um, also grow through rhizomes. Uh, so poison ivy also grows through rhizomes. So rhizomes go underground as a modified stem. They can have roots on them as well, but then they do vegetative reproduction, meaning another saw palmetto or poison ivy or whatever plant it is that has a rhizome will pop up a little further away from the parent plant. And what's also really cool about that is when the areas burn that have saw palmetto, it may look like the saw palmetto has burned to the ground because it's very flammable. But what actually happens is a new saw palmetto leaf will pop right up within days. Um, I've gone out and seen like even a day or two later a new leaf coming up because the rhizome did not burn so the plant doesn't die, just the above ground leaf structure may get burned. So some of these saw palmetto plants may be hundreds of years old because they have survived having that rhizome underground. And then of course cabbage palms are our state tree, which is sort of funny because they are a monocot, meaning they have vascular structures or the structures that transport water and food. The vascular structures of a monocot are a grass. So cabbage palms are actually more closely related to grasses. They aren't really a tree. So it's sort of funny that they're our state tree. Um, but there are a couple different types of palms that you would find in a pine flatwood. Grass is really important in a pine flatwood. Here are some of our native grasses. Both of these, um, for instance, you will find in Mayaka and in many of our county preserves. Uh, we also have a lot of invasive grasses, unfortunately, and I'll talk a little bit about invasive plants towards the end as well. Um, but wire grass is a really, um, really important native plant that provides food for some of our wildlife um, and is very, uh, very commonly found in our pine flatwoods. A lot of times in our pine flatwoods, you won't have a lot of that sort of shrub layer. Um, it'll be pines and then a lot of our grasses or smaller herbaceous plants. Ferns are really neat looking plants. I love ferns. The bracken fern is one that can tolerate a little bit more dryness than some of our other ferns. So the bracken fern is the one that you're going to find more often in a pine flatwood environment. And then this is just a really cool lichen. It's called the beard lichen. And if you look around, uh, they tend to, the beard lichens tend to be on pine trees. As you can see in the background of this picture, you sort of see the pine bark there, and this is a pine branch. So they like to attach to sort of that rough uh, bark of the pine tree, and they are really cool to look at. Um, many of our lichens that we see, especially here in Sarasota County, are the flat kind that just look almost like somebody painted a circle on the tree and often they're white or greenish or we have the red ones as well. But these beard lichens are really cool if you get a chance to look at them up close. So that's a little quick overview of what pine flatwoods are and some of the plants that you would find there. So now we're gonna talk about our second out of three uh, plant communities. We're gonna talk about hardwood forests, often sometimes called hardwood hammocks. That's usually how I refer to them. And they can be dominated by more the broadleaf trees, but once again, that's gonna vary uh, geographically within the state. Um, here we don't have many of the deciduous trees that you might find further north in Florida. So these are the three principal hardwood forests, and I'm just going to show you a map of where they're found. So the southern hardwood forest is only up here in the uh, panhandle, 
There's a little bit of mixture of some of those trees like tupelos and uh, yews and magnolias um, in with our mix here. But generally in Sarasota County, we're going to have more of a temperate evergreen forest. And then of course, when you get down here into the very tip of Florida, you're gonna have more of a tropical rainforest type hammock. Okay, principal disturbances, things that sort of disturb this type of plant community are gonna be storm, storm damage and human activity. Once again, the, the hammocks are not really um, disturbed by fire very much like some of our other upland communities might be. Here is really the trees that we're gonna see in Sarasota County in our hammocks. We're gonna see live oaks and laurel oaks. And of course, we're all familiar with our live oaks. They really characterize to me, Florida. Uh, they're just so majestic and large. And then of course they have the Spanish moss often hanging from them. And they also are home to a lot of our other epiphytes, which I have a slide on. Um, laurel oaks are not quite as spready. Um, they're gonna be a little bit more straight and compact and their leaf is going to be slightly different. Here are our epiphytes. So this is such a cool aspect of our Florida environment, especially our southern Florida environment. Epiphytes need a very humid environment in which to live in. So you're not going to find these types of plants like up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, you're going to this makes me think of Florida, these epiphytes. So of course, we all know our Spanish moss. We all see it every day. Um, really loves to hang from the oak trees, but can also be found in our cabbage palms and some of our other trees. Ball moss is also a very common epiphyte that we're gonna find um, in our oak trees. And then shoestring fern is super cool. Um, generally, this is gonna be in the boots of our cabbage palm, those parts of the cabbage palm that sort of stick out and they can have water collecting at the base of them. Um, and our shoestring fern, as well as what I call the licorice fern, some people call it rabbit's foot fern. Some people call it, it's poly, oh, I just forgot it, podophyllum polypoides is the scientific name. That one also is an epiphytic fern that likes to live in those cabbage palms. And then the butterfly orchids. These are just beautiful. Uh, they might be blooming right now. I have not been in too many hardwood hammocks uh, since COVID. I've pretty much been in the scrubby flatwoods. Um, so I haven't gone out to see if the butterfly orchids are blooming right this minute, um, but this is definitely blooming time for them. They are usually in the oak trees along with the ball moss and the resurrection fern, another one of my favorite epiphytic ferns. So epiphytes just mean that they are on or on other plants, they're off the ground, they're not terrestrial plants, so they don't root into the ground. They, we often call them air plants because they live up off the ground, hanging on to other trees. They have all sorts of cool adaptations, like they have these spongy root um, characteristics that allow the roots to absorb water droplets out of the air. Um, so just really, really fascinating, interesting plants and so unique to Florida. And the further south you get, when you get into like corkscrew and um, down into the Everglades, it's just amazing some of the epiphytes that you'll see. Okay, some representative vines. Um, we have a number of native vines here in Sarasota County. We have quite a few different species of Smilex, the one you see here on the left. Um, sometimes the leaf looks a little bit, there's actually one called earlobe Smilex uh, because the leaf looks a little bit more, I guess like an earlobe. Um, so we have a number of native Smilex. They have, depending on the species, have thorns on them. Some have more, some have less, some have bigger thorns. 
some have smaller ones. So some native Floridians will call this cat briar and it can get you when you're sort of hiking through the natural areas. This is grapevine. We have a couple different species here in Sarasota County as well. This is the one that I most often see, the one that has the leaf that looks this way. Um, the grapes are edible for us and wildlife, although they certainly aren't going to taste like the grapes that you get at the store. They're going to be smaller and a little bit more sour. And these are also native vines here in Florida. I'll talk about Virginia creeper first and then I'll end with poison ivy. Um, Virginia creeper has five leaves and this is what we call palmately compound when we have multiple leaflets, so sorry, those are leaflets, not leaves, multiple leaflets that make up the entire leaf. And when they come in a circle like this around a single point right there, that is called palmately and then compound because there's multiple leaflets in one leaf. Whereas poison ivy has three leaflets that make up its leaf. And that's why we say leaves of three, let it be. Poison ivy, I like to call it the trickster or coyote plant um, because it can trick people. It can be down low growing right along the ground. It can sort of send up these almost like naked stems and then have leaves closer to the top and be, you know, a couple feet from the ground. And it can also grow as a vine. And I have seen poison ivy vines in trees where the vine is mm, not quite as big around as my leg, but pretty big around, like this big around. And the leaves, I've seen like a, a trifolate leaf like that, that's bigger than my palm. And so sometimes we call them poison ivy trees just because it looks like the poison ivy is the tree instead of the actual tree. So you wanna be careful, like if you're canoeing or kayaking, there may be poison ivy hanging over the water because it's climbed as a vine up along a tree. Um, leaves can be all different types of shapes. They can sort of look like a mitten, like this one does. They can be very serrated and have lots of points or they can just be more ovate. So once again, trickster. The leaves can turn red, the stems can turn red, and of course they um, can have flowers and berries as well. So that's our poison ivy native here. So it's an important plant. It's just one we don't like to come in contact with. So that's our hardwood hammock overview. And now this is, this is my category that is near and dear to my heart because I just love the scrub. Um, the Florida Master Naturalist Program also includes dry prairie and rangeland into the same category. I'm not gonna talk about rangeland today even though there's, a, there's plenty of it here in Sarasota County. I'm gonna talk um, mostly about scrubby flatwoods because that's the type of scrub we have here and then just briefly about dry prairie which we have some of in Mayaka. There are all different types of scrub. It is uh, our most, I don't know if I wanna say valuable because I think everything natural is valuable. It's often been developed because it has sandy soil, so water drains very easily. It's a great place to put a house. It's a great place to put a citrus grove. So we've lost a huge percentage of our scrub statewide and countywide as well here in Sarasota. Um, so you can see from the map, there's just little pockets of scrub. Most of the scrub that is left is along the Lake Wales Ridge. Um, and we have some tiny pockets here in Sarasota County, but ours is mostly what you would either call oak scrub or scrubby flatwoods. Scrubby flatwoods are sort of a transition or what we call an ecotone. So they aren't quite fully scrub and they aren't quite fully pine flatwoods. If you've been to Oscar Shearer in the hot, dry areas, like where the scrub jays like to live, that's scrubby flatwoods. They tend to burn, this slide says eight to 30 years. Um, Oscar Shearer will burn more often than that. And then other types of scrub like rosemary scrub only burns historically every hundred years. So it really depends on which type of scrub we're talking about. 
Here's oak scrub. So this looks a lot like Oscar Shearer to me. Um, although the true oak scrub is going to be found um, mostly along that central Lake Wales Ridge area. You're going to find a lot of scrubby oaks, which are different from live oaks or laurel oaks. They're going to be different species. They're going to stay preferably six feet or below that in height. Um, you also will have a lot of dry or xeric sandy soils. And generally in oak scrub, there's going to be patches of open sand where animals like the gopher tortoise are going to be able to burrow or the scrub jay is going to be able to bury its acorns. So those things are really important characteristics of the scrub. If we don't burn the scrub, then things start to overgrow. Then the scrub jays don't like it when the trees get too high. And if they don't have enough open sand, they can't bury their acorns and they will either not exist in that area anymore or they'll leave it if there's somewhere for them to go. <coughs> Excuse me. Same thing with gopher tortoises. If there's, if the um, scrubby oaks start to get too tall, if they start to overgrow, um, there's going to be less grasses for the gopher tortoises to eat, less places for them to burrow. So fire is a really important land management tool in these um, scrubby flat wood and oak scrub areas. So here are some of the scrubby oaks. Oaks can be divided into red oaks and white oaks. Up north, where I first learned about ecology and started becoming a naturalist, it was really clear because if you're from up north, you know the red oaks, they are very, they sort of have like that shape if you are a kid and you draw a Christmas tree, they have those pointy ends to the red oak leaves. Here in Florida, the oaks are pretty much all oval for the most part. Um, so it's harder to tell a red oak. Up north, a white oak has rounded leaves, rounded lobes on its leaves, but here it doesn't go that way. So here are two of our red oaks. Excuse me. So red oaks, their acorns tend to be higher in tannins, so they're a little bit more bitter. Um, and the wood is a little bit redder, so there are some uh, morphological differences between the red and white oaks. Here's our white oaks that are commonly found in the scrubby flatwoods here. So Chapman's oak does have more of that rounded, sort of what I consider more typical white oak characteristic to its leaf. Um, and sand live oaks, these are the ones, if you've been out on a walk and trying to identify the scrubby oaks, the sand live oak <coughs> is the one that we talk about being a canoe because if you feel the leaf, the leaf edge curls under. So if you picked one of those leaves and flipped it over, it would almost look like a canoe. It almost looks like it could float on water and carry something because the edges are curled up. So that's our sand live oak. Here's another Lyonia species. This Lyonia, um, this one, I mean, both Lyonias can be found in scrubby flatwoods because remember, scrubby flatwoods are scrub and pine flatwoods, sort of that transition. Uh, but the rusty Lyonia, we have a lot of this at Oscar Shear, a lot of it in some of our county preserves as well. And you can really see that um, defining characteristic. It's got rust colored leaves. So at certain times of the year, those are very prominent. So you can really help identify the rusty Lyonia by those um, rust-colored leaves. They're, they have some rust-colored hairs on them as well. And then I just tried, there's so much, as you can see, that I could talk about about all this stuff. Um, so I, I've tried to pick out things that were either very representative of the plant community we were talking about or some of my favorite things. And these are two of my favorite things from the scrubby flatwoods. Prickly pear cactus, it is so phenomenal if you get to see one in bloom. Um, I actually, this is the picture from the Florida Master Naturalist Program, but I have some beautiful pictures I'll have to add into this presentation in the future. Um, these blooms can just be huge. 
Uh, they're so lovely. Often if you find them and take a photo of them, there'll be some type of spider or insect or something inside the bloom. So you might have a little surprise in your photo. Uh, and they're just wonderful. And then of course, once this prickly pear cactus gets pollinated, then it turns into what we call the pear, which is a reddish type sort of fruit of the cactus. And it's hard to find those because, oh my gosh, the gopher tortoises love those prickly pears. So the wildlife will often eat that prickly pear fruit before we even get to see it. And earth star mushrooms are super cool. Uh, they are just fabulous. I do find them at Oscarshire. I have seen them in a few of our county parks, but the place I've seen them the most is Oscarshire. And especially after a rain, of course, this is the fruiting body of the mushroom. Mushrooms don't have flowers, but that's how I would think about this, is this is the flower or fruiting body of the mushroom. The rest of the mushroom is underground. But these come out after a rain. And the center, if you find them right, just at the right time, is like a puff ball where the spores will be in there. And these are a little bit dried out in this picture, but they will look more like a puff ball in the center. And you'll be able to tap the center and get some spores out. And they're just, they're just beautiful, cool things. And when I'm out on a field trip with kids, it's really cool to find them with the kids because the kids are like, what is that? Is that a flower? Because they're really dry and brown. So they know they're not really a flower, but they don't know what they are. So co super cool mushroom, the earth star. Both of these plants, they're studying for cancer research, actually. So that's another cool thing. All right, we'll talk really briefly about dry prairie. This is gonna be the last sort of overview of the plant communities in the uplands, and then we're gonna talk more about land management and the Florida Master Naturals program. So this is just, this gives you an idea about how we distinguish dry prairie from wet prairie. It's really about how long, how many months within the year that prairie is wet, where the ground or the water table comes above ground. So in a dry prairie, it's really only going to be wet um, or above ground for about one to three months. A wet prairie, it's going to be much longer than that. So wet prairie is going to have at least five months of standing water. Um, Mayaka has, I, yeah, I believe Mayaka has a little bit of both. Where I usually go is into the dry prairie, though. Um, other places where there are larger expanses of dry prairie is the, um, the Kissimmee area and DeSoto County as well. Really characterized by herbaceous vegetation, a lot of grasses and smaller herbaceous plants, also very flat. Um, dry prairie usually would burn every one to four years. So there are some areas in Mayaka that if they're able to, they'll burn on an annual basis. And here's one of our native blueberry species. You can see the blueberries in the um, pine flatwoods and scrubby flatwoods as well, um, but definitely you can see them in the prairie. So that's the one that is related to our fetter bush and our other lionias. And they tend to be sort of short. Usually when I see them, they're only about, what is that, about eight, maybe at the most 12 inches tall. And the blueberries are delicious if you find them before the wildlife does. Here's some of the other plants. Um, I love this pennyroyal. Um, it's not a true pennyroyal, uh, but it's just beautiful to find. We have um, patches of this, I believe it's at Curry Creek Preserve in Sarasota County. Um, and then we'll see the yellow-eyed grass in a lot of our county preserves as well as Mayaka. We have a lot of different native goldenrod. So there's one of them that you might find, the pine barren goldenrod. And then we see black root a lot in Sarasota County. And that's just a really cool plant to see. Um, it's got these winged appendages along the stem. I always find that really interesting. And those winged appendages are green. So, you know, they have chlorophyll in them. So that provides some extra photosynthetic capabilities to this plant. 
All right, I'm almost on time. So we're gonna talk a little bit about land management in the uplands. Um, I'm gonna just show you, these are some of my favorite slides to show. I show them in almost all my presentations. So some of you that have been in my other presentations, you've heard this already. But this is a map on the left-hand side. This is the developed areas are in red from year 2010. And then the protected areas are in light green and dark green. And so you can see what you would expect. There's lots of developed areas around um, both the coasts. Uh, we really see Tampa standing out there as being very red, the Tampa Bay area. We see the whole Miami area um, and pretty much the whole East Coast. We see less uh, uh, development obviously in Everglades and throughout the panhandle of Florida. So that's what it was in 2010. The map on the right is what, if things continue how they have been going, what we can expect for 2070. And the reason I like to show this is because if you just think about wildlife, where is wildlife, especially some of our larger mammals like our panther and our bear, where are they gonna go if this is how our trend continues? And so it really just drives home for me this idea of not only conserving areas so that we have protected areas, but also thinking about connectivity of those areas, wildlife corridors. Um, if we start talking about climate change and potential rise in sea level, that might mean that species, their ranges will move either inland or move more north as things get hotter and sea levels rise. So are we protecting enough area to take some of those things into consideration? So just things, things to think about. Um, I've also given you some Sarasota County slides. Uh, this is from our Sarasota County department that actually does demographics for the county and keeps track of all these things. So this particular map just shows us residential units built in 1950 or earlier. So what is that? 70 years ago now. Wow. So 70 years ago, the blue dots are where we had a lot of residential development. So I'm going to jump us forward, and this is all based off of census data, so there's actually a slide for every 10 years, but I'm just going to jump us forward to our most recent census, which um, has data through 2010. So look at that difference. The blue is um, residential built 2000 or earlier, plus the green is from 2001 to 2010. So anything in blue or green, this is now the developed areas of our county. So let me go back. Look at that change. Um, and we, it also has the population there. Our population now is well over that. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but it's quite a bit more. Um, so once again, just thinking about our natural areas, conservation, where is wildlife gonna go? You can see my, um, is protected. This is Mayaka here. Uh, so we have a huge swath of the Eastern part of our county protected, but is it enough? So what that really speaks to is habitat loss. And then I don't like to just mention habitat loss. I like to mention habitat fragmentation too, because fragmentation is when we have little tiny bits of habitat available, but it may be fragmented in a way that it's not really usable. And we're really seeing that with the scrub jay population in Sarasota County. Um, my husband, who uh, drives the Scrub Jay Working Group, um, he unfortunately feels that it is very possible we might lose Scrub Jays in Sarasota County in our lifetime if things don't change. And of course, we're all, many of us are working on trying to make that change. But the habitat that Scrub Jays need is so fragmented that we're not getting some of the genetic diversity that we need. We aren't always having viable populations. We might have one scrub jay somewhere. Well, that's great, but it's not a viable population. There aren't gonna be scrub jays 20 years from now from that one scrub jay. So just things to think about. Um, we also see this as a problem with some of our other wildlife, like this slide depicts the bald eagles, which have made a great comeback but they need, they aren't like ospreys. Ospreys are very comfortable building their nests around human habitation. Bald eagles aren't. 
So they need a large area that is close to water so that they have a food source to feed both themselves and their young. Um, so as more and more development encroaches, we are limiting the habitat for some of these amazing animals. There's our Florida scrub jay. So um, hopefully you've had the opportunity to see a scrub jay before. Um, that Florida scrub jay is actually on a rusty Lyonia. Um, and then you can see the comparison to a blue jay in case you're not familiar with how they look different. Um, our scrub jays really need to be in a scrub habitat. They need the scrubby oaks to be six feet or less. They need um, those open sandy soils. <coughs> they don't like a lot of tall trees, so that's another reason why managing scrub jay habitat with fire is really important, not only to keep, keep the scrubby oaks low, but to also limit how many pine trees or taller trees there are. Those are the trees where um, raptors and are, going to, uh, are going to perch and those are the enemy of the scrub jay. Scrub jays have tons of interesting characteristics, uh, really neat adaptations. I can't go into them all right now because this is an overview, but I do have a scrub jay presentation that'll be a full hour on scrub jays coming up sometime in the next couple months. So we have that information at the end of this presentation. I also have a gopher tortoise presentation coming up. I think that's my next one. So that one's a little bit sooner. Um, love to talk about these guys too. <coughs> Another really important um, keystone species, especially for our scrub, Lots of other species depend on the gopher tortoise burrow in order to escape from fire, escape from predators, escape from just the general heat of the day. Um, some of the commensal species that use that burrow need it to um, lay their eggs in. So these guys are, and gals are super important to our ecosystems. <coughs> and then everybody loves a panther. Uh, do we have panther in Sarasota County? Well, we don't have any panther living here because we don't actually have enough of a range for a panther to live here, but certainly the panther, the male panthers could be traversing here. We now do have, um, I believe, two female panthers that have been identified by FWC that have crossed the Caloosahatchee River. That hadn't happened for a really long time, so, but they they aren't tending to get quite this far north, I don't think. Um, it's more the males that have the larger range that might actually um, wander through Sarasota County, but most people that think they see a panther here actually saw a bobcat. So um, there's some differences in how they look, um, and there's some differences in the size of their tracks for you to look at, and then um, this is really one of the best vantage points, and generally if you see one of these animals, you're probably going to see them walking away from you or running away from you. So notice the difference. Very different if you see them side by side. Our bobcat's going to generally be much shorter, although they can be tall and lanky. They're going to have a short tail. Now bobcat's tails can be like just a tiny little nub, or they can be longer, but a panther's tail is going to almost hit the ground and the tail of a panther is going to be just about as long as its actual body. Um, bobcat tails will never be that long. Notice the ears. Bobcats have black, white, black on their ears. So they have those contrasting color coloration and that white spot. Panther ears are just all a solid brown. And then of course notice that the panther is also a solid sort of tawny brown color with a little bit of white on, underneath, whereas the bobcat is, has quite a variety to the colors and is also spotted. So besides ha habitat loss and fragmentation, we also have a lot of issues with invasive plants in the uplands. Kogan grass, oh, if you talk to anybody that actually does invasive plant treatment in our natural areas like our state or county parks, Kogan grass is like their nemesis. It's very hard to manage, it's very hard to treat, it has to be treated consistently or it just comes back. 
So um, when we say invasive, so let me back up for a minute. When we say invasive, what that means is it is a non-native species, so it doesn't belong in Florida, it's come from somewhere else, and it is causing ecological or economic damage. So some non-natives grow here, in, well, lots of non-natives grow here in Florida, but not all of them become such a problem. When they become a problem, that's when we label them as invasive. And there's all sorts of organizations that do that. Um, University of Florida has a lot of information on that. I um, am the co-chair of our regional CISMA group, which is our regional invasive plant group. Um, we're having an invasive webinar coming up in, I think a week, I think next week. So if you wanna learn more, there's lots of opportunities to learn more. Um, let me just cover these really quick. Rosary pea, this is very common in the uplands. It's a vine. Um, it is very prolific. It makes a ton of the seed capsules that have multiple seeds in each capsule, and then they dry out and sort of burst open. Rosary pea is the one that is incredibly poisonous. It has abrin in it, which is a toxic chemical. So those are ones that we also don't want our kids getting into. Air potato, this is also a nemesis right now. I just filmed a field trip at Redbug Slough. Cassidy was there helping me. And the area of Redbug Slough we were in was just covered with air potato. So once again, an invasive plant, um, both the air potato and the Kogan grass make what we call sort of monocultures, meaning they will overgrow and push out our native plants. Um, air potato is just incredibly, it just, it just grows like crazy and it vines up into the trees, it vines over the ground, it has these bulbils, which are why it's called air potato, because they look like potatoes, um, that just can withstand so many different um, elements and grow more of these. And then Japanese climbing fern, um, we also have old world climbing fern. Um, sometimes in our wetter areas, but this can become a problem. Um, also just very prolific. It has billions of spores that are carried by wind and water to other locations. So these are all things that our natural areas personnel are all fighting against. And here, this is just always fun. Um, plants are one thing, but generally people just really love to see some animals. So um, the cane toad picture and the black spiny tailed iguana picture, this is from one of my master naturalist classes. Um, let me think which one, wildlife monitoring, I think. Um, I believe for wildlife monitoring, I bring in um, someone from FWC, from their, our non-native uh, office down in Fort Myers. And he is a herpetofauna guy. He's got his own pets, and then he also works for FWC to deal with some of these invasive reptiles and amphibians. So he brought to class a cane toad. Um, I'm getting lots of questions about cane toads right now. They aren't super um, common here in Sarasota County, but we do want to keep an eye out for them. These are the ones you see on the news. They're very large, larger than any of our native toads. You can even see in this picture, let me get my cursor back, right there is the poison gland. So that gland is filled with this noxious stuff that we call bufotoxin. And that's what you see on the news because if your dog grabs that toad and some of that bufotoxin gets released in their mouth, if your dog's small enough, it could kill your dog. And even for a larger dog, it can make them incredibly ill. Um, so those guys, you want to keep a look out for those. And then our black spiny tailed iguanas. This is the iguana that's our bigger problem in Sarasota. We have some green iguanas occasionally, but it's a little chilly still up here for the green iguanas. Um, the black spiny tailed iguanas are in a lot of our coastal upland parks. So Shamrock and Lemon Bay have a lot of issues with these guys. And then here's our Cuban tree frogs. So you've probably all seen one of these, if not many of these around your houses. Um, so these are invasive non-native amphibians. And if you have questions about those, we can talk more about them later. 
I want to talk a little bit about prescribed fire. So as I keep mentioning, a really important land management tool, um, especially for our pine flatwoods and our scrubby flatwood areas. It helps to restore and maintain them. It can be a management tool for invasive plants, although some of the invasive plants will actually do better after a fire, so it just depends. Um, it also, one of the really important things to educate people about prescribed fire is it is a really good thing, not only for the environment, but for also for us. So people get concerned when they see fire, rightly so, but what those prescribed fires are doing is they're reducing fuel buildup. So they're reducing the amount of debris that could burn if there was a lightning strike, so that if there is a lightning strike, there is less likely to be a severe wildfire. And if there is a wildfire, there's less fuel to burn, so we're more likely to be able to put it out before it becomes a real problem. So the prescribed fires are a management tool that allow the people that do it, the forestry service, the park service, our county park, some of our ranchers, it allows them to manage their land and it also helps keep the rest of us a little safer from wildfires. Of course, historically those fires would have been started by lightning and they would have just burned large expanses of Florida before we were all here. Um, on the right hand corner, that's a pr the prescribed fire that happened. That one was about a month ago. My house, this is in Oscar Shear, and my house is just off the side of the picture, um, back over here. Uh, so I have a prescribed fire webinar coming up as well, and I'll show you lots of pictures of prescribed fire, mostly from Oscar Shear during that webinar. Um, this is actually my husband right here, and they're on the other side of that burn, which is much further away from my house. This was actually a large zone that they burned, um, and here they are on the actual burn line managing that fire. And this is only part of the personnel and the vehicles that are out there. Um, there's more vehicles and people, and they're all um, making sure that this is managed the way it needs to be to um, keep this area safe and not allow it to spot over and become a problem. And there's a picture from that zone, the night. So the fire happened, I think they, they started the fire around 11 a.m. I think they had it out probably by like about 2 p.m. and then they do what's called mop up where they just, they're constantly checking it and they're um, watering down anything that looks like a concern. This is at sunset that same day in that same zone and this is a mother deer. Her fawn was off to the right hand side of the picture here. Um, by the time the fawn stood up and we saw it, the lighting wasn't good enough for me to get a picture. But there was a mom and her fawn in this zone and they, they might eat the ash to get some extra minerals in their diet. Um, they're gonna love this zone in the upcoming weeks because there's gonna be new plant growth that they're gonna love to eat. Um, so this is really a great management tool, not only for the ecosystem, but for the animals and the plants in there. All right, so I've got about 10 minutes left. What I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes before we open it up for questions is I'm now going to give you an overview of the Florida Master Naturalist program. So you'll learn about what this program is about and the classes that are offered. And then I'm just going to show you some pictures from some of the field trips that we've done in the past, and then we'll open it up for questions. So the Florida Master Naturals Program is a statewide conservation effort here in Florida. There are other states that have Master Naturals programs. They're often very different from ours. Um, so ours is specific to Florida. It was developed by Dr. Marty Main, who's a UF professor and wildlife ecologist. Um, this program, I didn't put a timeline on, but the first class was offered in 2001. So we're coming up on our 20th anniversary uh, and we plan to do, uh, we don't know what we're doing yet, especially considering our COVID-19 situation, but we're hoping to have some sort of um, statewide or regional celebrations for the program. 
Um, I forgot to mention that I'm also the president of the statewide advisory board for the Florida Master Naturalist Program. So um, not only do I teach the classes, but I'm very involved in sort of what we're doing year by year for this program as well. Um, Shelly Johnson is the current program coordinator at University of Florida for this program. And then Shelby is the registrar. So these are Shelby and Shelly are the people that um, you might get emails from if you become, uh, if you get involved in this program or if you need to ask questions or things like that. This is the mission of our program to increase awareness, understanding, and respect of Florida's natural world among Florida's citizens and visitors. So it's really about teaching people about Florida and the importance of all of these wonderful aspects of our natural environment here. And we say that we teach those who teach others because I really, I always talk to my classes about I'm creating environmental stewards when I teach these classes. Although many people that come to the classes are already environmental stewards, hopefully I'm adding to that. But I really think of all of us as sort of being people that then go from these classes and teach others, even if it's just our own kids or grandkids or our spouses or whatever, or friends, even if we just go out kayaking or go for a hike with somebody else and we just share something we've learned, we're helping to promote this mission. So you don't have to go out and like, run a field trip for school kids or do a public program for adults. I mean, that is great if you want to do that with the knowledge from this program, but just learning about it and loving it and sharing that passion with others is going to make a difference in our conservation future. So here's what the Florida Master Naturals program is. We have three core modules. These are 40 hour long classes. And we are today, we previewed a, just a tiny, tiny, tiny little smidgen of the upland course. Um, there's also a coastal course and a freshwater course. Um, as I mentioned, we teach all of these through our extension office. Um, Moat Marine here in Sarasota also teaches um, the coastal and freshwater classes. I think there's even teaching more than that now. Um, we've got instructors in Manatee, Charlotte County, all throughout the state teaching these. So these three classes, we call them our core classes because, well, they're longer than our other classes, but they also really focus on the most important ecosystems here in Florida. I just gave you that small little overview, but each of these core courses has a book associated with it. I'm going to hold mine up if you could see me. So it is a really thick book, or you can get this all on a USB flash drive. But there are something like 12 chapters in each of the core module um, books or guides. So this is a lot of information that we cover with you and that you will have at your fingertips if you take these core classes. So a lot of people like to start with these, but you can take any Florida Master Nationals class in any order at any time. So you don't have to start with these and you don't have to do them in any order. In each of the core modules, we cover three different sort of main um, commu plant communities or habitats. So like in uplands, I covered pinelands, hardwoods, and the scrub prairie and range section. Then there's four special topics, we call them. These are 24-hour courses, and these tend to be more specific to a skill or a specific area of information. Um, we have taught all of these except conservation science. We were just about to offer conservation science when COVID hit. Um, so I usually teach habitat, eval, wildlife monitoring, and environmental interpretation every year or two. Um, so I won't go into the details about those, but you'll be able to go to the website and look at the details if you're interested in these. Um, these, we usually have um, skill, uh, skill, not tests, um, skill examples where like in wildlife monitoring, we go out and we do things that wildlife biologists would do to monitor wildlife populations. In the environmental interpretation, we teach you how to interpret the environment for, uh, for the public. So there's a little bit more about what each of those classes is about. 
These are super fun. Um, you know, it's a whole new situation now with COVID and our virtual world. So we're all trying to figure out how to still make these super fun in a virtual environment. But for instance, in my wildlife monitoring class, we always have our FWC gopher tortoise biologists come and we scope gopher tortoise burrows. Um, you know, there's just really fun, amazing things that we can do in these classes that really give you hands on experience in some of these areas. And then there's also restoration classes. These are the newer classes that have been developed. We have a coastal restoration class that's uh, started about a year or two ago. And then this year we are starting the marine habitat restoration as well. And then there is a new class that's just been developed. It's a new special topic called invasive plants. So I think it's just plants. Um, so we haven't, as instructors, we're going to preview that program next week or two, I believe. So it's not even open to the public yet. Um, you get certifications for the different levels, or if you take all three of the core modules and all four of the special topic modules, then you are an advanced Florida Master Naturalist. So that's sort of fun. A lot of people get really excited about working towards their certification. I will tell you one of the things I'm saddest about, this is how much of a Florida Master Naturals program lover I am. The thing I'm saddest about is I became an instructor after I'd only taken two of the core courses. So I don't actually have my Florida Master Naturalist certification because now I don't get that once I become an instructor. Now I'm just an instructor. So I'm sort of sad about that. All right, I'm going to show you a couple fun things pre-COVID-19 that we have done for our, mostly for our uplands field trip. So here we are in a burn zone at Oscar Shearer State Park. Um, this is our class from 2019. Uh, we did a field trip to um, Oscar Shearer. We learned from the state park biologist about scrub and the animals and plants in the scrub. And then that's my husband next to that pine tree. And he's talking to the group specifically about prescribed fire and management techniques. This is a very typical pine flatwood here. And then on the other side of the path that the students are standing on, so to the backs of the students, there is scrubby flatwoods. It's a really neat place to go in the park because you've got two separate types of plant communities with a fire break in between. So there they are just from a different vantage point. They got to take a tram ride because I usually teach this class in the summer, probably the worst time to teach uplands because they are hot, 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 hot. This is our, um, our bug lady here at Sarasota County Extension, Carol Wyatt Evans. And she helped us with our invertebrate chapter in our Uplands class. And we did some, uh, what did we do? We took some butterfly nets out and we tried to capture some bugs, butterflies, and spiders and identify them all. So there we are all looking around at the different insects that we caught that day. Um, here we are back at Oscar Shearer. Uh, this was actually a wildlife monitoring class, but sometimes I do this for uplands too. Where This is an area where there is a scrub jay family. This particular class, um, we actually had some of the Oscar Shearer people showing us how they trap train the scrub jays to come into a trap on their own, a live trap, so that they can be captured and then banned it. So we learned all about scrub jay banding that day. Here we are in one of our county um, preserves. This is Sleeping Turtles South Preserve. There are amazing epiphytes here. I think there's at least one person on the call that's been to this preserve with me and looked at some of my favorite epiphytes. Um, it's a beautiful area, so sometimes we go there. Here we are out on the dry prairie with park ranger Mike Stanfield from Mayaka River State Park. We did that in our freshwater class, but dry prairie is really more of an uplands environment. The reason we went there for this class is because to the left of this photo, there is a depression marsh with carnivorous plants. And so we took the group into 
um, that depression marsh and identify some of those cool carnivorous plants that were there. And here we are. This was um, also Uplands last year. This is my student group. Um, there are bat boxes at the Rookery, which is the Venice Area Audubon Society um, space. And back behind the Venice Area Audubon Society building, there's the Rookery where birds, uh, where birds nest. And then there's bat houses. There's now six bat houses. And I usually do an evening bat program for my Uplands class. And we um, learn about bats and then we go out and we watch all the bats exit those bat houses. Super cool, very fun.